Hi everyone, my name is Peggy Wu and I'm from SIFT. Uh, my talk today is on incorporating psychological theories into simulations and serious games. First, a little bit about us. We're a small business founded in 1999, headquartered in Minneapolis. We have offices in Boston, San Diego. I'm based out of the DC area and we have about 35 full-time employees. We have advanced degrees in artificial intelligence, automation systems, control theory, anthropology, linguistics, psychology, and these are some of our capabilities. On the computer science side, we have intent recognition, real-time planning and scheduling, and on the psychology side, we do human-computer interactions, linguistics analysis, um, modeling human systems, and we also have the engineering capabilities to support these research domains. Here are some of our customers and collaborators. We primarily uh, do basic research from the Department of Defense and NASA. Here's a timeline of some of our previous work. We started in the year 2000 with the Rotocraft Pilots Associates program looking at how we can improve the cognitive decision aids uh, method of communication with the human, whether it's communicating about its intent or uh, providing warnings and cautions. We've grown that work in a number of different directions, from modeling human-human uh, communication behavior for language and culture training, to sociolinguistics modeling, to virtual environments for improving psychological health. Today, I'm going to talk about our sociolinguistics work um, and our work for NASA. Since 2003, we've been creating and developing and validating a computational model of how humans communicate with each other. We took uh, theories from sociolinguistics and created a computational model so that we can incorporate it into virtual agents. Let me show you a video. In this mission, the trainee, Sergeant Mike Jones, must try to use his newly learned skills in the Pashto language of Afghanistan and Pakistan to enlist the aid of local villagers in building a clinic. Here, Sergeant Jones has finally managed to arrange a meeting with a local leader, the Malik. As in all such reasonably formal meetings, this one begins with introductions. I'll use a greeting I know. Wa alaikum. Notice that each of the interactant characters in the Malik's party are shown on the side of the screen with a green trust meter. This meter is designed to reflect the current degree of trust or liking that that character has for the trainee. When I spoke, a second window popped up near the Malik. This window shows the degree of imbalance between the etiquette or politeness that the Malik heard in what I said versus what he expected. The fact that the top bar is red and to the left of center means that he interpreted what I said as slightly rude. In fact, wa alaikum is an informal greeting. Note that his trust meter has decreased a bit, too. The reaction of the Malik to the different utterances the trainee made were computed by an etiquette algorithm we created based, in part, on the sociolinguistic theories of Brown and Levinson. This theory says that polite behaviors are used to redress or offset the threats inherent in social interactions. Thus, when more redressive value is perceived than there was threat, the utterance will be seen as increasingly polite and the summary bar in our etiquette interface will move to the right and turn blue. When less redress is used than there was threat, the utterance will be perceived as increasingly rude and the summary bar will be red and to the left of center. For example, when the Malik said to me as the trainee, the utterance Salam Alaikum, the Malik as observer perceived this as a fairly polite greeting. Note that the algorithm can handle interactions that include gestures and other nonverbal content, such as the hand over heart gesture used with Salam Alaikum. It can also take into account different cultural perspectives on the same interaction. 
Our etiquette algorithm can also be used to recommend utterances based on the level of perceived etiquette that is desired. For example, let's say I want to provide a greeting response to the Malik that he will perceive as being about the same level of politeness as he gave to me, a score of 60. Here, the etiquette algorithm suggests that I respond with Wa Salam Alaikum, with a hand over heart gesture. Let's try that, and other polite responses. We'll start the scene from the Malik's greeting. Now I'm expected to provide a greeting in response. I'll use the polite one with the hand over heart gesture that the etiquette algorithm recommended. Wa alaykum salam. Note the green plus sign that appeared over the Malik's head, the green etiquette bar, and the Malik's rising trust meter, all indicating that the Malik perceived this response as warm and polite and that he is becoming more favorably disposed towards me. So Brown and Levinson's politeness theory builds upon Grace's sociological concept of face, this universal, uniquely human idea of social capital. Uh, Brown and Levinson takes it a, a step further and separates that out into positive face and negative face. Positive face being the idea that everyone wants to be viewed as a positive, valuable member of society. Negative face being the concept that uh, everyone has a right to their autonomy, a right to not be disrupted. And Brown and Levinson posit that each interaction poses some kind of threat to that face. The fact that I'm demanding your attention right now at least threatens your negative face, your desire to be autonomous. Brown and Levinson uh, believe that politeness is a method that is universal and used to redress that face threat, and that, that the amount of politeness used is a function of the amount of uh, face threat that interaction poses. The amount of face threat, in turn, is dependent on three components. One, the social distance between the individuals, whether I am your best friend or your enemy. Another being a power difference, whether I'm your superior or your subordinate. And the third being some kind of raw imposition, uh, whether I'm asking for the time or if I'm asking to borrow a thousand dollars, some nature of the task. So we use this concept to create these embodied conversational agents for culture and language training. And we thought, well, what about for natural language based user interfaces so that the human can uh, interact with automation in a more natural way? And further, does the politeness of the automation affect the human's performance? So the question is, do machines have etiquette? Should they? Does it matter? Reeves and Nass at Stanford uh, found empirical evidence um, suggesting that people regularly bring to an interaction with the media, with uh, their computers, with automation, the same set of social expectations they would as if they were interacting with another social agent. Um, they called this the media equation. And in fact, you might even uh, bring those expectations to that interaction without even knowing it. Now, so what if humans are interacting with their computers as if they're social beings? Does that impact performance? Paris Herman and Miller uh, found that in cognitive decision aids, that provide polite, that is non-nagging, non-interruptive messages to the user actually improved the user's trust of the system, their perceived work uh, their perceived workload, as well as their overall work performance um, over those decision aids that regularly interrupt um, or not wait for the user to complete one task before uh, providing another request. We ourselves found that polite automation um, 
increased user compliance, increased user trust, um, their perceived workload, and also their reaction time. So we were commissioned by NASA to see whether we can expand this idea uh, to support their vision for deep space exploration. In the mid-2030s, we are planning for a manned mission to Mars. And just to give you a bit of context, the distance from Earth to the International Space Station right now is 220 miles. Uh, no calm delay, virtually always connected. Astronauts can use the IP phone and call down anytime they want with real-time communications. And further, the astronauts on the International Space Station are not flying the ship. Um, it's Mission Control who's flying it. Now going to the moon is, is a bit further, 230 miles, 1.2 seconds, uh, one way delay. And going to a near earth asteroid is even further at about 1.2 million miles. It now takes light about six and a half seconds to travel one way. Now Mars at its closest is going to be 34.8 million miles. It will take light about three minutes to get there. But a lot of the times it's going to be much further at 250 million miles. It's going to take light 24 minutes, which means there will be no real time communication and there will likely be a lot of time with blackouts. Um, the current design reference mission is that it will take six months to get there, 18 months on the planet's surface, and another six months back. There will be a lot more crew autonomy. And further, the crew will be in a small, confined, extreme environment with uh, five of their best buddies. Right now on station, there's a beautiful cupola. Astronauts can look uh, down and do some earth gazing anytime they want. On the way to Mars, most of the time, it's going to look like this. So we know that the sensory monotony, uh, the fact that they're going to be confined in such a small space, the social monotony, they're not getting any new visitors, uh, they're not going to see any new faces. Uh, these can cause psychological stressors um, such as fatigue, drops in productivity, anxiety, hostility, uh, increased risk-taking behavior, basically make you a bad crewmate and even a worse roommate. So we thought about using a virtual environment, a virtual world, as an extension to their real world in a program called Ansible. Ansible is a virtual environment or virtual world currently consisting of 24 different regions where they could do a number of different activities. And the idea is to combine the rich visual and audio stimulus that a virtual world can give with both human controlled avatars and virtual avatars to expand their uh, physical environment and their social environment. Let me show you a video of some of the capabilities. The Ansible project demonstrates a prototype virtual world that astronauts on long-duration spaceflight missions can use as a psychological home away from home. Ansible provides activities that serve as ways to escape the confines of the spacecraft, explore new forms of interaction, and stay in intimate contact with family and friends back on Earth. The communication delays native to long-duration space missions make traditional connections such as real-time video conferencing impossible, Email and other asynchronous communications remain available, but adding a rich three-dimensional environment gives astronauts the opportunity to spend some time in the same space as their loved ones while on their voyage, even if not at the same time. The keystone of the Ansible virtual world is called the FAMCOM, or Family Communication Center. At the center of the FAMCOM is a large hall showcasing the phases of the moon, 
with its current phase back on Earth indicated by a gentle glow. Above the moon is a model of the sun and terrestrial planets, showing the trajectory of the astronaut spacecraft on its way toward Mars. The red line indicates their progress along the journey. There are several activity rooms within the FAMCOM, all designed to reinforce a connection to home and Earth. The library is a space for relaxing, playing the virtual piano, or an ongoing game of chess with a family member. Or one can visit the art gallery, with its regularly changing exhibits of artwork. The club is where the astronauts can sit amongst other avatars. These are programmed AI agents that can engage in small talk, and act as an interactive audience for stand-up comics or video shows. They can also fill the dance floor when the club turns into a disco. In the post office, astronauts can pick up a 3D file from home for printing on board, or they can play a specially created two-player game with a family member back on Earth which has been designed to elicit positive shared memories. The Earthlinks room provides the latest in Earthside weather, recent snapshots via Google Maps, a skylight linked to changing weather patterns, and a recent video of an Earth-based weather event. An astronaut doesn't have to stay in the Famcom. There are other interesting places within the expanse of the virtual world. For example, they can choose an interesting vacation from a range of virtual destinations in the vacation room, take part in a historical recreation, dive a coral reef, or enjoy a quiet evening in a small town on a front porch at sunset. All are possible. Through one door of the Famcom is the amphitheater, where presentations from Earth can be uploaded to the video screens and enjoyed on demand. Another door leads to nature walks, virtual campsites, and serene rocky shores. The last door leads to the meditation center, where classes and mindfulness can be accessed via recorded sessions. There is beautiful landscaping and a Zen garden for strolling. Also within the Famcom, astronauts are able to access private areas in the Ansible world designed for family interactions, which can be reached by clicking on one of the signs to teleport to a private region. Crew and family can design these areas to resemble their own homes, or one of imagination. This space is an example, with a living room, kitchen, dining, and family rooms, as well as a garden area. All of the items, as well as the rooms themselves, can be selected from one of the three available malls that are stocked with a variety of merchandise. Special events, such as a shared virtual Thanksgiving dinner, can be held in the private home spaces. While a real-time dinner is not actually possible, a metaphorical dinner can be held asynchronously, with each family member visiting the space and leaving a note about what they are thankful for that others can enjoy later. This type of activity can help reinforce the emotional ties between family members even while they are separated for many months. We have based the offerings within Ansible on scientific research that indicates the psychological value these forms of activities have for people. We believe they will also serve in their virtual form to enhance the astronauts' experience on long-duration space voyages, allowing them to remain better connected to their loved ones, expand their perceived space through the expanse of the virtual world, and provide them enjoyable activities for their discretionary time. Our next phase of work will utilize the virtual world space as part of a NASA analog mission to see if the activities we have planned can surmount the communication delays while providing social and family connections that are meaningful and psychologically beneficial. At the same time, social learning theory combined with the social context that a virtual environment can provide tells us that learning can be done in the virtual environment um, for learning maybe positive social behaviors. This is the idea of immersive entrainment, that you can obtain a mindset, behaviors in the virtual environment and carry it over into your real environment. Ian Balenson, when Nick Yee was at Stanford, coined the term the Proteus effect. The idea that the physical attributes of your avatar, that is the virtual attributes of your virtual avatar, um, can affect your real behavior. And there's been empirical evidence suggesting that 
people who have observed avatars in a virtual environment be rewarded for increased exercises will actually increase their own exercise behaviors in the real world. Ideas in neurocinematics and mirror neurons suggest that virtual environments can act as a meaningful extension to the real world. The fact that we can feel the same feelings when watching somebody else perform an action uh, suggests to us that we can feel those same feelings watching our avatars perform various behaviors without having to do those behaviors ourselves. And if virtual environments can act as a socially meaningful extension to the real world, then other psychological theories can come into play, such as the Kohler effect, the idea that a person tends to work harder when they're in a group. Uh, industrial psychologist Otto Kohler in the 1920s and 30s found that members of the Berlin Rowing Club worked harder when they were part of a group as opposed to as an individual. They were able to lift heavier weights, they lasted longer, and he posited that this was because uh, the individuals didn't want to be seen as the weakest link. This resonates with the idea of positive face, the idea that everyone wants to be seen as a valuable member of the team. So we performed a literature review looking at various psychological wellness promoting strategies uh, that has been observed in historic space flight, in real world, um, and we brainstormed those ideas to see what can be operationalized in a virtual environment combined with a calm delay scenario. And these were the different strategies that we used within the Ansible system. So is it going to work? We don't know. Uh, that's why we are going to test it. And we're going to test it at high seas, Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. It turns out that Hawaii actually looks a lot like Mars. Now, this is the part of Hawaii where you don't want to be. Um, on a, an active volcano on the side of Mauna Loa. It turns out that there's no life there, uh, or very little. There's hardly any plant life, no animals. Um, and the University of Hawaii, um, along with their sponsors, have built a habitat uh, for testing various aspects of uh, living on the surface of Mars. The high seas habitat houses a crew of six. They're typically an international group, a gender mix, and they are isolated in the environment unless they're coming out to do an EVA, an extravehicular activity, uh, such as a geological survey. When they do come out, they have to don their spacesuits, and within the habitat, they are limited in their communications and that they have a, a 10 minute calm delay. They don't have real time internet. They pretty much rely on email as a connection to the outside world. Um, they are, there are a number of things that are measured in the habitat, their energy usage, their uh, food consumption, their water usage. Uh, they do have their private quarters and um, We've been involved in all three of the previous missions. The first two were four months long. Uh, the third one, the crew just came out in June, uh, was an eight month mission, and that acted as the control group for Ansible. Uh, the one that's upcoming, uh, the crew will be entering the habitat end of August, will be a 12 month mission. Uh, and there we are going to be deploying the Ansible system, asking the crew to interact with it for about half an hour, three times each week. And we're also asking their family members and we'll be measuring uh, various 
metrics about social connectedness um, and their sensory and their sense of sensory monotony. So given that the crew hasn't entered the habitat yet, um, we don't have any results to share, unfortunately. Uh, we do have a quick word cloud of uh, the previous crew when we asked them what were some of the experiences and things that they missed most. Um, and we found through the, the survey throughout the eight months, um, as well as in the debriefs, that some of the things that they missed most uh, were consistent among our interviews with astronauts and our lit review of previous space flights. Uh, and these were along the lines of nature in inspired uh, stimulus such as sunlight. One big phrase that was used was sunlight on my skin. Um, it should be noted that they do have a window in the habitat, but um, whenever they go outside because they have to don the spacesuits, they never actually um, you know, feel the sunlight on them. And it was interesting to hear some of the comments from the crew in the debriefs. Uh, one crew member said that when the winter, I think when the uh, spring or summer rolled around and the light was shining through the porthole, it made, you know, this little tiny circle of light on the floor. Um, and all six crew members would kind of huddle together um, and just feel the warmth of the sun coming through. Another kind of general aspect of the things that they missed most um, were just friends and family. And we think that providing the, this virtual environment that will give them the nature-inspired stimulus, that will allow them to interact with uh, their family members through recordings of their avatars and seeing their, their family members' avatars walking around, taking walks, talking to them, even though they're pre-recorded, uh, can be of psychological benefit. And this is the end of my talk. Uh, this is my avatar in Ansible exploring a region of Mars, Gale Crater. We downloaded the topography data of Mars uh, and loaded it in our environment. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me at pwu at if you have any questions. Thank you very much.